watercolor channel, Laurel Hart Work. I'm Laurel Hart. If you're looking for tightly detailed and photorealistic ways to paint, then this channel is not really for you. But if you like loose, intuitive watercolor techniques, then stick around. I'd like to thank the new subscribers and all you regular viewers for watching and for posting really very informative and lots of times entertaining comments and questions that give me great suggestions for further posts. And um, I would suggest to you that if you want to learn some techniques that are unusual and interesting, follow the comments. It's fun to be connected all over the world simply through our love of this beautiful and addictive medium that gives us a watercolor high that we all love. I've had recent comments from Romania and Mauritius. I had to look up where that was. I want to start my demo today um, by making a little confession. I'm addicted to binge watching Victoria on Masterpiece Theater. The problem with binge watching is that you can watch an entire season in one week or even one day, and it's usually eight episodes long. And then what happens is major depression sets in when you realize you have to wait another whole year before they can produce the next season and you go into mourning. Anyway, I highly recommend the series. I love everything about it. The British royalty, the characters, the gorgeous sets and costumes, and the historical events that I've really learned a lot about. And now you're probably wondering what this has to do with watercolor. Well, if you are a fan of the show, you can probably guess what really endeared me to Queen Victoria, and that is that she loved painting in watercolor. So how cool is that to share a common interest with the Queen of England? Anyway, Britain's kings and queens have been inspired to paint for generations, and Victoria and Prince Albert were no different. During the Victorian era, watercolor really came into itself. It became a high point for excellence in style and technique, but it was also a time that celebrated amateurism as well. As one writer said, this was the peak of watercolor popularity when everyone from common school children to the royal couple, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, were out painting the English countryside. I think sometimes we give the term amateur a bad connotation, thinking that it refers to someone who's not very good. But in reality, the word amateur comes from a French word meaning lover of. An amateur artist is someone who paints simply because he loves it. A professional maybe does it for love, but also for money. Back now to Victoria. In one of the episodes of season three, we learn that Queen Victoria kept a watercolor sketchbook in which she recorded intimate and private scenes of her life with her family. And I had to look that up to see if that was really true. And I found out that she really did, and her paintings really do exist. And so I wanted to check and see if I liked them. And they really are charming. I'm going to show you just a few examples of some of these sketches that she did. This particular one is Lord Melbourne, who she calls Lord M. This one is um, Beatrice, and I don't know if that's a daughter or, or some relative anyway. But I just think they're really lovely. They are very uh, sketchy and loose and incomplete. This one is um, one of one of her sons, one of the princes. And I just, I just think her faces are really well done. But again, there's this area of unfinishedness and um, what looks like a sketch. This last one, I don't know exactly who this is of, but um, I just think it's really a lovely little um, painting of this woman and so well executed. I just think they're wonderful little pieces that she did. So in the episode that I'm talking about, if I got the story right, she sends some of these really cute, sentimental little paintings from her sketchbook to a publisher to, re to be reproduced for her own use. And somehow they end up getting sold to a newspaper and published. 
and the queen is really angry and humiliated because she thinks these sketches are going to demean her in the eyes of her subjects because they show her bathing her children and doing other ordinary tasks that the common people would perform. So she fears that she's going to lose the respect of her subjects. But it turns out that quite the opposite happens. The people fall in love with these paintings precisely because they show the queen doing things that they can relate to as commoners. And they clamor to buy these sketches to hang in their homes. So she ends up endearing herself to them by unwittingly showing that she's not above them. So I thought that this little incident showed how being rich, glamorous, and powerful isn't always what appeals to people. Sometimes we like knowing that the rich and famous are also ordinary people who put their pants on one leg at a time like the rest of us. The subjects of queen, the Queen's paintings were commonplace and therefore they appealed to the other common subjects of her court. I think that this lesson applies to the subjects that we choose to paint. Often we spend lots of time and money searching for glamorous and romantic places to paint. We think that we have to travel to exotic places for worthwhile subject matter, when really some of the most meaningful subjects can be found right under our noses in our own familiar surroundings. These are the things, after all, that we have more of an emotional attachment to, and for that reason can help us create more authentic paintings that we truly have ownership over. I think viewers can tell when there's an emotional connection between the artist and the subject. I want to just give a little bit more of a background, and before I get into my painting, about the uh, watercolor sketch as it was made popular in the Victorian era. In London in the 1800s, there was a gallery called the Dudley Gallery that provided exhibition space to amateur watercolorists to exhibit their paintings in. These were paintings that didn't get into the more highbrow exhibitions. And these watercolor sketches were considered unconventional because they went against the academic standards of the day, often having kind of an unfinished or rough look to them. Some of the characteristics of these paintings included um, pencil underdrawings that showed through, rapid brush strokes, blossoms and other watermarks that were left in the painting, dry brush textures, and colors that were mixed on the paper rather than on the palette. I don't know about you, but a lot of that sounds familiar today to being, to, uh, being the very elements of loose painting that we aspire to and look for in art today. Eventually, these paintings came to be seen as more sincere, more poetic and spontaneous than the more academic counterparts, which were exhibit in the main, exhibited in the main watercolor shows. And these artists were eventually celebrated for their romantic sentiment, rather than for the quality of their technique. So in other words, the content of their art was valued more than the execution. So today what I want to do is to paint what would be termed a watercolor sketch of a familiar subject to me and try to incorporate the characteristics that we just talked about earlier um, about a watercolor sketch having an underpainting of pencil um, and hopefully keeping it rough and loose, which is easier said than done. I'm not in the habit of keeping a really regular watercolor sketchbook, but lately I have been doing some smaller sketches and I've come up with a list of advantages that I can see to doing this. I'm going to show you uh, just a few examples of some of my recent sketches that um, I'll share with you now. This is one of... Um, my grandchildren, where we are feeding ducks in Park City. And um, as you can see, it does have kind of an unfinished look. It's not painted corner to corner. And um, I, I was quite happy with this little sketch. This one is one of my sister. Uh, it is based on her planting flowers at my studio. So this is a sentimental subject to me, and um, my sister has a real green thumb, and I, 
I wanted to capture this little memory. That's what these little sketches are so good for, is just kind of freezing a little moment in time. And then these are two more small sketches I did not too long ago, both of my daughters and their son, daughter and son. And you can tell that there's just really not a lot of detail put into these. The faces are just very suggestive, and so are the figures of the children. And they're just, um, it, the intent of this is more to capture um, the feeling of the, um, of the subject and the moment in time rather than an exact replica of the people that you're painting or the subject that you're painting. And maybe that's an excuse we use to say, well, I didn't mean to have it too realistic. But <laughs> anyway, I think you get the idea on that. So I'd like to share with you um, this list of advantages that I have um, compiled as I've been working on some of these little sketches that I think um, are very valuable to you and um, are good reasons to practice keeping a watercolor sketchbook or working on these small scale little jewels of paintings. First of all, working small is a really good way to practice. You can learn more by doing several small studies than you can by doing one large complicated piece. And often these little paintings will be fresher and livelier than large complex paintings, partly because you aren't feeling pressured to turn out a, su a successful uh, result and because you're working more spontaneously. Also, you don't need a whole studio space to set up. You can hold a, a, a sketchbook right on your lap. You don't even really need an easel. So a small space or a corner in your house will do or outside. The sketch uh, teaches you to work quickly and you don't necessarily need to feel like you have to feel every inch of the page. Like I mentioned, it's liberating. And in other words, it can really lead you to being loose. Once you've got the focal point nailed down in your uh, piece, you can quit at any point. Watercolor is really such a beautiful medium that it can look appealing at almost any stage of completion. So it can teach us not to be afraid of quitting once we've captured the main idea. A watercolor doesn't need a background to be a standalone piece of art. So that's a, another good reason for practicing these. These small watercolors can end up leading to future, uh, leading to them being future references for more complex paintings. So they can stand on their own in preserving what might have been a fleeting moment in time. Finding time to paint a whole completed painting can be hard to do each day, but a small sketch need only take a few minutes. So with that, let's get going. I've taken way too long on this introduction, but I hope it's had some valuable information for you. I'm going to start um, painting on the subject that I've chosen. What I've decided to paint today is something that is very sentimental and um, close to me. Um, this is um, my son-in-law and my little granddaughter, Fleury, on her christening day. And we are in these pictures just over right next door to me in the backyard of my, my uh, father. And those blossoms are his peach blossoms. He has a peach orchard that has many fond memories um, for me. So I went through some of these wonderful little sentimental scenes of, of him. I just think they're so tender with this dad and his little first baby girl. And the one that I ended up selecting is this one that I've got on my board um, where he's holding her up and against these beautiful pink blossoms back here that I'll try to incorporate. But I'm going to try to um, keep in mind the things that we've been talking about in terms of a watercolor sketch. That being I'm going to try to to leave it somewhat unfinished and I'm going to um, not worry about covering the entire page, as, as we said, and hopefully it will end up having a, a loose and a, a wonderful um, intuitive feel to it. So I'm going to start. I have my usual 
uh, low Cornell brushes here. Uh, they're round 70, 70 20s series. And I've got a six, an eight, and a 10. I'll be using mostly the six, or mostly the eight through the painting. And then to start out, um, to stay loose, I'm gonna try to use one of these. Um, these are Rosemary Sable Kalinsky brushes. And I'm going to use this to start out with them. Um, not getting too tight with the tight brush to start with. And that's another good um, rule of thumb to follow. So I'm gonna start, and I'm not doing the conventional method that I normally do, where I usually will start with a triad of color. This is gonna be a little bit more direct, where I will come in with the uh, color that I'm working with at the top and coming down. So you're not going to see me do uh, an underwash of a triad really in this particular painting. Although it, it will be the pretty much those traditional colors that I do use. I'm gonna start with um, permanent alizarin crimson on these blossoms. And actually um, going over one paint next door is um, is quinacridone red, but I think I'm liking this pink. It's just a little bit pinker. So this is just very diluted permanent alizarin for the blossoms here. And I'm just gonna start daubing these on kind of randomly. leaving some parts of the uh, blossoms that are in the sunlight just kind of showing, but they're gonna be very abstract, abstract shapes, not, not really too, not really worried about whether it says blossom or not. I think it, it will in the end. Okay, and maybe maybe I'll go ahead and put in just a little bit of the suggestion of these branches too here. I'm just gonna kind of let that all all bleed together here. And then I'll come back um, while this is still just a little bit damp to put in um, a little suggestion of the shadow areas in the blossoms. And I've, I used to kind of do this by adding a purple to it, but it really, I think it's better to just do a little more concentrated version of the color rather than adding the purple. It, it kind of, uh, the color. Okay, and some of this I'll just kind of blur out over here. So still again trying to keep things pretty loose and not really worrying about, about accuracy. That's the thing where we kind of get bogged down and um, start to worry about things, I think. So then sh I'm going to put in this little bit of her hair, making this dark here and hopefully letting that bleed back into the flowers just a little bit there. Okay. For my skin color, I am going to um, 
I'm going to mix some alizarin crimson, which I've already got here, with some yellow ochre. Not that much yellow ochre. And um, if I can, I what I want to do is get this dark enough that I don't have to come back in over it. Each time you come in with a successive layer, it takes some of the freshness out of it. So if I can do it, I'll do it. If not, I will have to come back in. But um, I think I am going to want to put in a little bit of a little bit of purple in with that. So with her face in the shadow there, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty dark there. So I think that's going to be pretty close to what, what I want there. And then, um, and then over here, I want to uh, keep those little light patterns on her cheek there. Coming down in here. Pick up my bead down here. And then one of the things that I like to do when doing a face that I think for me works a little better than adding in is to sometimes just take my tissue. I'm just picking up that bead there, but for her for her little nose there. Sometimes I will just pull out a little bit of that color to um, leave kind of an indication of her, her nose. And a little bit more of that. And then as this little, as this wash on her um, face dries, I can come in with uh, a little stronger mix of that flesh tone. Maybe add a little bit more of the purple. But I don't want to be a whole ton stronger because then sometimes it the features just look way too, way too um, stark or um, severe maybe. Okay, and this is still really bleeding, so I'll wait a little bit on that one. And that's going to come around. And also, I'll maybe just lift out a little bit of her bottom lip there. I think maybe it might be time that I can put the eyes in a little better. And sometimes those will just kind of flow on their own and look like they're supposed to. Often we think we have to do it for the watercolor, but it often will just do what we want it to do for us if we let it do its own thing. So I'm not going to fuss too much with this face right now. I'm just going to leave it and come back to it in a bit. I'm going to move right on to the little dress. And this is um, this is manganese blue. Um, I actually might want to do some endanthrene blue, which is over here. And that comes right up.
right up against her little face there. And again, if I can keep myself trying to stay with the values as I want them in the end painting and not have to go back in, I know I will be happier with this painting in the end. I'm going to get her little arm in up here. And I'm not going to worry if that bleeds a little bit into the dress. I don't mind that. I think that's it's a good way not to end up with uh, too many hard edges everywhere. Okay, then this is going to be a little bit of blue around here. And I'm going to lighten that flesh tone there because it's, it's very light. And then this part of her little gown or dress is going to be kind of fun because it's these creases that I can um, use to kind of do some dry brush out here and just give a really nice varied edge to that, um, to that little dress she's wearing. Okay. I want to get this hand in here too. Still dark, a little bit more, a little bit more definition to the lace and stuff in there. But then again, I'm going to blot out the kind of the light on his hand and his knuckle there. I've given him more of his arm showing than what is actually there. Okay, I'm going to put a little bit more darker flesh on here. Where we've got those patterns of sun. Coming up on that knuckle. down into here. Okay, I'm going to define in between the 
fingers here just a little bit more. I'm carrying on this shadow flesh color again down below on his other hand. Some other kind of shadow there, but that kind of is showing the curve of his hand there. And when you when you've got a curved surface like like there on his hand and his knuckles, that's usually going to indicate well indicate that you should use a soft edge there. Okay. Going to leave that. I'm not going to worry about it being totally correct at this point. And now down here under that hand I want to um, set off the sleeve on his dress shirt there. And kind of show a little bit of the lace texture of her dress if I can. And then I, I just kind of want that to bleed off into the bottom of the paper there. Not finished. And working on his hair. I think I'll pull that into a little bit of sky up in here. And I'm not going to I'm not going to really try to finish that off in any way. Just a little bit of a suggestion that there's some sky back in there. I want it to bleed off that quite that much. And then while his face is still, well his hair is still wet, I want to get his face in. And he's in the sun, so I'm not going to want um, too dark of a But over here, he, 
it, it is going to be darker since he's in shadow back here. And then I'm going to pull out the cheek area and the chin area there too. And I don't know why it is that that uh, seems, to, seems to work better on a face for me to, to pull out some of the detail rather than put it in. I'm not sure of the reason for that, but it just seems that way. And again, I don't want too hard of an edge on that place where his neck is curving. I'm going to go in while that's still wet. Because I just don't feel like I've got that really darken up over here. I think that's a little bit better. There is just a little, a little glow under his chin there, so I'm going to pull that out. Would be where the reflected light is, and um, again, I don't want to go too, too awfully dark on his, his eye socket there either, but. Soften that edge of his cheek there, too. Okay, and I'll come back to that in a minute, probably. Still wanting just a little bit of a darker uh, purple just right there in his eye. OK. 
Okay, and the um, this little part of his um, of his collar is has got a glow from the sun coming behind it there, and then his collar over here. He's got this really pretty shadow stuff going on on his on his um, cuff as well. That kind of is a fun indication of the shadows of those blossoms and stuff. Okay, I don't want to leave too much white in the center there, but I am I can tell there's some right down through there. And then we want to, I just want to indicate those little, kind of right in here. And then, okay, that's the stuff coming right down into his shirt. And maybe just give a kind of an indication that that is where his elbow is bending right in here. I don't want to do just a straight old edge along there. See how much nicer that um, crooked edge to his sleeve is? At least I, I think it is. Okay, now... I can come back in with a little bit deeper, um, almost a purpley blue. So that's still in dantherine blue and a little bit of alizarin crimson added in to set off his, um, the edge of his collar there. So what I'm doing now is just kind of adding in some of the last darks. I want to differentiate here where her little dress ends up. And then I need some uh, cast shadow down in here under his I need to make a correction on his hand there that's kind of too big
and maybe adding in a little, just a little bit of the dark so that we can tell that that's his um, sleeve there. The edge of his shirt sleeve. I'm trying to keep kind of a transparent look to that lace. And then I should probably describe here, he's got, you can see the inside of that sleeve is coming. around his uh, hand there. And I can see now that I, I need, I do need a darker value on his, uh, the shadow on his hand there. That's more the value that I need there. Okay, so um, I can tell even on the baby's arm, I, I've got to go back in with a darker value for her little arm being in the shade, but I can now get those cute little sun things across there. Okay, and I do want to get her eyes in a little bit more pronounced than what I've got them, but not so dark that they stand out too much.
That's, I think that really is one of the problems when we do faces. Often we'll do um, the features too dark. And then they just kind of stick out too, too much. Ears and other things on the body that protrude are usually quite a bit redder. Um, so I'm going to give him quite a bit of red in his ear here. And then the inner little part in there. I want to do her little mouth, but I'm a little scared to. And then usually there's a little shadow under a lip, so... I think that sets it off a little bit. Okay, and then she's going to have a little... I think this is her ear out here, so... kind of want to get that in there. I might need to kind of describe a little better what's going on under her arm there, her under her little sleeve. I can maybe pull out a little of that lace edge. With a with a brush. But um, there's a shadow over his finger, and then kind of still coming down around there. Okay, and... That finger is way too fat, so I'm going to put some shadow in there in between those. And there's also a little shadow where he's kind of got her arm squoze in there a little bit. I think that um, maybe describes his hand a little better there. Okay, then we've got a little shadow here under his... Under his chin. And 
and I kind of missed the curve of that thing, but there's another little shadow out here. And a little bit of a, on this part here that's coming forward, there's a little bit of purple. And I can maybe describe one of those buttons there. Yeah, I like that a little bit. Her head is looking a little bit lopsided as I see it in the monitor. So I'm going to fix that a little. Describe, I'm going to try to describe these little flowers that she's got on her head here now. Getting a little bit of shadows in those here and there. Now I'm kind of thinking her head's a little too tall. Baby's heads are actually bigger than we think. <laughs> Okay, there's a shadow under his nose that um, needs to kind of define his I probably need to do some kind of little shadow under the bottom of his nose. Under noses are usually in shadow. And then his lower lip
and maybe just darken this little part in here in his ear. And I feel like I want a little more um, of those pink blossoms to come. To come across there. Because there are quite a few right in there. So let's put some of those in. And those are just a lizard and crimson. But I like how that's kind of leaving another little white against her face there. The edge of her little dress comes up a little higher than that. And I'm going to see if I can pull out some of that sun on her arm there with just a damp brush. They cannot look too, too funny. I'm actually going to pull in maybe just a touch of uh, this is um, white gouache. And you don't want to use too much of this, but I kind of lost my little highlights right there. On her little arm. Okay, I, I think I think I'm about to call it. Remember, it's supposed to be very loose and very um, have a bit of a rough look to it, which it does. Um, I'm kind of tempted to go back into his hair and d deepen it a little bit. And maybe I'll do that just right uh, a little bit where the wet up where the part goes. And let a little bit of that um, bleed.
way down and up there. And probably it should be a little bit darker back here in the shadow part too, so. I'm gonna do that. Yeah, I think it needed that a little bit. Okay, well, I think I'm going to call it there. Um, I might need to just soften my little cheek here so that that's not a hard edge. On the baby. And anyway, if I do need to make some corrections, um, I'll do that. But I think that's the lesson for now. Um, I wanted to just leave with you a little story at the end of this uh, lesson on painting familiar subjects. This is something that I share in my book. Um, in his classic Acres of Diamonds, Russell H. Conwell tells the story of a rich man, Ali Hafed, in ancient Persia, who heard that if he could find a diamond the size of his thumb, he could purchase much more land than he already had. So he sold his property, left his family, and went in search of valuable diamonds. Ironically, while he was gone, the new owner of his property discovered diamonds buried in the white sands of the land he abandoned. Had he remained home and dug in his old fields, he would have been well rewarded. Like Ali in the story, we often search for these exotic subject matters to paint while overlooking the most valuable sources of all right at home. When we paint what we love and are most familiar with, there will be a passion and honesty to our paintings that will give them genuine worth. Thank you for joining me today, and I will hope to see you another time you're welcome to leave comments on this segment. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to look at those. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.